When you're running a small business, your hours aren't the traditional nine to five. You work around the clock. You guys all work around the clock. I know you. You work harder than I do, so the limited hours at the post office can be very frustrating. I don't even know where my post office is. I'm not lying. That's why I need, and that's why you need, Stamps.com. Get postage on demand right from your desk whenever you need it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. With Stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. Guys, I've been telling you, uh, I'm being serious. For so long about Stamps.com, you just have to cave in and do it. And once you do Stamps.com, you're going to say, Wow, that was super easy. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. Seriously, get everything. Stamps, shipping labels, the instant you need them, then just hand them to your letter carrier. You don't need an expensive postage meter anymore. I know you got those in your office buildings, right? Don't need it. You will never have to go to the post office again. You can get everything on demand these days, my podcasts, fights, shows. So why not get stamps on demand with stamps.com? It's what I used to send out my merchandise for my show and fan letters and signed 8 by 10s that I sent to dry cleaners all through the San Fernando Valley. It's so convenient and easy. Right now, use my last name, Moore, M-O-H-R, for this special offer, no risk trial, plus a $110 bonus offer. Includes a digital scale and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the home page. Type in more, M-O-H-R. That's stamps.com. Enter more. And I tell you what, when you email me, send me a letter. Write me a letter using stamps.com. And all it says in the letter is, this is a letter I sent you using stamps.com. These are good people. I do a lot of favors for you, don't I? Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game change. Donuts. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Oh, hey, buddy. Oh, yeah. Uh, welcome to More Stories. My name is John Ferguson Cox Moore. My friends call me JJ. And I'd like to think if you're listening to this, you're my friend. I see you guys out there when I'm out doing stand-up. I got to tell you, uh, this is the first podcast being recorded uh, since my trip to Kentucky, Tennessee. Uh, Louisville, uh, not so fucking cool. Got to be honest with you. Uh, Nashville, off the charts crazy bananas it's a reason they called zanies it was zany <laughs> that was so stupid and then uh and then uh right now we're driving back uh from knoxville side splitters and that was tremendous and basically i'll let you guys in on some showbiz inside knoxville comedy club and um the nashville comedy club had something the louisville comedy club did not have and that is people in it uh, Louisville just uh, seemed to not really care. But I got to tell you, Nashville, Knoxville, holy smokes. But I did have one of the greatest shows I've ever had. Sunday, there was 28 of you in Louisville. You know who you are, and I love you guys. All right. This is a Mobile More Stories. We'll put it up as a bonus. It's a super special guest for me. I'm making the rounds doing radio in uh, Nashville. And they go, okay, here's the sport. What's the sports station? 1025 The Game. 1025 the game they go go on in here you'll do uh steve gorman sports and i go okay i'll do steve gorman sports and i walk in it's fucking steve gorman the drummer from the black crows has a radio show in nashville and we became friends and i dominated him with black crows questions and we only have one mic so you guys that think i interrupt too much will be happy when i hand it over so uh quickly too late quickly uh, Gorman uh, goes, when you leaving for Knoxville? Because I drove from Nashville to Knoxville. It's like a three-hour drive. I tell him when I'm leaving. He goes, well, how about I drive you there and uh, we'll record a podcast in my car? So if you ever wanted to know how cool the drummer for the Black Crows was or the host of Steve Gorman Sports, 
Uh, he's pretty fucking cool. He's uh, driving me. He's not with his wife and children. He's not drumming for his new band, Trigger Hippie, with Joan Osborne, of course. And uh, Jimmy Osmond? Who else is in that band? It's actually Alan Osmond. You don't you don't remember Alan. He was always... He's kind of like Marlon Jackson. He just wasn't, you know... He didn't really get it. That's Who else is in the band? Jackie Green is in the band. Nikki Govrick's in the band. Guy named Tom Bukovac's in the band. I'm in the band, and uh, and it's pretty darn good. And Joan Osborne. You've already said that. All right. Uh, how did you guys all come together for Trigger Happy? Uh, it started many years ago, as all things do. Much longer. You would have thought if it was that many years ago, you guys would be a little more popular by now. Well, you know, you would think that. But you, you as a showbiz veteran, you understand how long it takes to get a, a project off the ground, Jay. It's true. Uh, it started in, in a bar in East Nashville in 2004 when Nick, the bass player, and your good friend, Audley Freed, and I would jam. We'd show up and just call out songs and play for fun on Wednesday nights. And uh, at some point during that, I said, you know, we actually play more like a band than a bunch of guys jamming. Let's start a band. And 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 they said, yeah, sure. And now, eight years later, it's finally actually kind of a band. Are there plans for Trigger Hippie to release an album? There are plans to, uh, I like to use the term global domination. Uh, we, we'll release something soon. We were just recording the last few days, actually. So we have a lot of material that we're putting down. Do you guys have a label, like a record deal? No, we don't have anything. We just have good songs and a, and a lot of fun together. And right now, that is uh, plenty for us. How did the... Uh, first of all, thanks for coming to my show and driving three hours, six hours round trip. I, you know, I like I like a good road trip. And, uh, you know, I don't get to Knoxville often enough. Uh, what was the plateau we drove past? Uh, the Cumberland Plateau, Jay. The what? The Cumberland Plateau. You were so proud. You were such a nat. You go, Jay, this right here, all this, this is the Cumberland Plateau, son. You see, son, this part of Middle Tennessee, there's a large granite formation under the Earth's surface. Now, I don't really know what it is. It's it's just a hill you go up. Really? That's that's the extent of my knowledge of that. It's Well, it's more than I knew. And then uh, we were in Nashville together at Zaney's, which was kind of an historic building. And then we pulled up the side. All love the side splitters, obviously. A uh, bit of a shit kicker building from the outside. It's between a cracker barrel and uh, what looks like a day's in that's uh, doubling as a crack house. And uh, it reminded you of the good old days, you said. I, I thought of a place the, in Jackson, Mississippi called W.C. Don's that we played once upon a time. I, 1988, I think, and I still remember it clearly. A double wide trailer. One of the, one of the most fun nights. That, that was in the Mr. Crow's garden days, pre-Black Crows. And, uh, a double wide trailer. Never forget the sight of, uh, walking in and the guy's gonna clean up the floor from the night before. So he opens the main doors and doesn't take a push broom to get rid of all the, the cans and the red solo cups. He cranks up a lawnmower and just blows it all out the side of the trailer. And then, and then we play a gig that night. We're opening for a band. Uh, we're just the opening band for, from Atlanta. We're doing a few nights all around the Southeast. No one there's ever seen us or heard of us. And the song She Talks to Angels, we did have it in the repertoire at that time. We play it. And we're in a club, and people start slow dancing like it's a dance, like dancing. That doesn't happen in rock clubs, no. the slow dance. But at W.C. Don's, they did, and it was a lot of fun. What is, what's W? Is that the name of the guy, W.C. Fields, W.C. Don? W.C. Don's was an acronym for we couldn't decide on a name. <laughs> and that's a true story. And that's one of your favorite gigs, the good old days? Do you, how often do you reminisce about that stuff? Uh, I do a lot of that on I-40, oddly enough, yeah. Is that what we're on now? Yeah, that's what we're on now. Is there, it must be, when you're playing theaters, when you're playing the Greek theater in, um, in New York, you're at like, you know, I don't know, what do you play, Radio City? Sometimes. Yeah, it, it, wherever. There must be such a romanticism. It seems like anybody with success in show business, there's such a romanticism of when we didn't have success. Why? Like, you're talking about W.C. Dons and stuff. Why do you think that is? Why is that? Well, I, for me, I mean, I've always said the most fun I ever had doing this was the 87 to 90, you know, when no one was watching and paying attention and there was no pressure. I mean, it was desperate. 
But, you know, every day we got up and all we thought was, what are we going to do? You know, how, what's going to happen today? You know, what, what, what might happen? Who knows? You know, because that was our life. And looking back now, it's real easy to see. I think the reason that we had a, I think one of the main reasons we did well, or, or had a break, I mean, had a chance to do well, I should say, is because we literally didn't care about anything else. I mean, we were so single-minded and focused on just the band. And even before we had a real band, and even before we were any good, we were we were consumed with the idea of being a band, and that was it. And so, you know, if if we lost our electricity, or if the phone got cut off, or if or if a girl dumped you, we just didn't care. Nothing else mattered. There was no, there was no. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. But I look back on like. 87, 88, 89, just pure, it was just pure fun and it was exciting and thrilling. I dropped out of college, moved to Atlanta and started this band and I just felt like, you know, I'm finally doing something. It was like I really, I didn't have any goals. I just knew every day it was, you know, anything weird and funny could possibly happen and usually did. And I felt it at the time. I was like, it's never, it's not going to be like this forever because either we're going to get a chance to get this and do this full time. I won't have to go make pizzas or work at a record store anymore. Or I'm just going to do this for a few more years, and if it doesn't work, I'm just going to go back to college, I guess, go get a real li- I don't. I, I knew right away, like after a couple of years, I thought, I'm not going to be doing this shit when I'm 35, still trying to make it. Like, as I'd see the older local bands, and I just was like, I, dude, you've been doing this 10 years, and that didn't happen? Now, that now. I was lucky enough where within a few years we got a deal, so I, don't, I never had to find out if that was true. But I didn't like seeing guys in their 30s still lugging gear, especially drums, you know, like up and down steps and loading in and out of the van and all that. I just thought that was kind of nuts, like, you know, hit it and quit it. You know, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, get on to something that does. So you started the Black Crows, essentially? Mr. Crow's Garden was already playing when I got there, and at the time that was Chris and Rich. Rich was still in high school, so they were playing on weekends. They had a different. They had they had already gone through a few bass players, a few drummers, because they were all kids, and it was like somebody'd be into it for a month and then not be into it, you know. But they were very serious already. Like they had songs, and Chris and I were roommates. I met him right the day I moved to Atlanta. I met Chris, and then I met met Rich the next day. But Chris and I moved into a house together with some mutual friends. So right away we were hanging, and uh, and I I, he was. People don't know this. He was really f- obese then. It's the first. He was one of the first lap band success stories. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, absolutely. Can you pull out this uh, drink holder for me? I will. I got all Let me... my holes occupied. Like a good little bit All right, perfect. So, Mr. Mr. Crow's Garden's up and running, and then how does it transform into the Black Crows? We, uh,. I feel like we're going to hit a speed bump, and this mic's going to knock out one of your teeth. I'm holding. you got to understand. We're in a, can I say what kind of car you drive? Certainly. Keeping it real. Steve Gorman, 99 Volvo. Keeping it so real. Family man all the way. And it's nice to know that we're safe driving on I-40 in this Volvo. Very, very, very safe. We can take a side hit. We can get rear-ended. I can, I can go right into this guardrail, and we're, we're not going to feel a thing. Let me see. Hang on. Uh, all right. So, whoa, Mr. Jesus, Gorman, what the f- Jesus? You are rock and roll, man. Uh, oh my God, I I feel like I'm in Hanoi Rocks. Wow. <laughs> you wow. The, the, the very the 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 very rarely heard Hanoi Rocks reference. Uh, how many? All right. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Crow's Garden to the Black Crows. Go. We're sharing a mic. That's why we're doing it this way. Mr. Crow's Garden's playing in Atlanta, 87, 88, 89. Where, where, I'm sorry, where does, Mr., where does Mr. Crow's, where does that come from? I don't know. That's when we'll get Chris and ask him. All right. Should, so we, should I hit pause? We're playing. He's in Nashville tomorrow, in fact. Are you st- you're, you're I said be- one, two, three times, four times. All right, baby. So uh, we're playing. Uh, and Occasionally over the over the years, we're saying, should we have a new name? Because if you call yourself Mr. Crow's Garden, someone says, what's your band called? You say Mr. Crow's Garden. They usually say this, either, huh? Or they go, Mr. Coast Guard? What? And so it took about three. That's a, that's a gay band, Mr. Coast Guard. It took about three of those for me to go, might not be the best band name. <laughs> you know, I don't know about this. But so we got a deal. Uh, Mr. Coast Guard. We, we met, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
we uh, we get a deal in a late '88 we, or 1988. We met a guy named George Takulius. He worked for A&M Records. He liked the band. Saw what we were trying to do. He ends up leaving A&M. He goes to Deaf American. Early '89. He says, "Let's make a record." We said, "Great." We're making a record. We're in the studio. The summer of '89. And we, the name change comes up, and we say, "All right, let's. We should change the name." But we couldn't come up with any. We thought, "Well, let's be the something crows."